at Charleston Air Force Base, South Carolina, the C-17 is joining the Air Force. We'll show you how we're helping introduce the new Globemaster III into the airlift fleet. As the C-17 progresses through its test program and enters service with the Air Force, it continues to prove itself. It's proven it can carry massive equipment, including rocket launchers, helicopters, and the Army's main battle tank. It has also demonstrated that it can back up on the ground under its own power, airdrop cargo and paratroopers, and operate in severe winter weather. It's achieving revised range and payload commitments, while performance tests show it will operate from 3,000 foot runways. And it has successfully completed airframe stress tests and reached one lifetime in durability tests. Early in April, the 11th production aircraft became the sixth C-17 delivered to the Air Force at Charleston Air Force Base, home of the 437th Airlift Wing, the first operational C-17 unit. The mission of the 437th Airlift Wing at Charleston is to provide strategic airlift to our customers, Army, Navy, Marines, and other Air Force units. And we do that in a great way all over the world every day, 365 days a year. An airlift is a complicated process. Uh, one, pe well, one sense of thought is that uh, airlift is like Federal Express, or airlift is like an airliner carrying people from point A to B. Airlift is much more than that. Airlift is picking a customer up from where they live to delivering that customer to where that customer has to go. And there's a tremendous amount of coordination and interface that goes through that, that whole process from uh, where is that package? How is the package packaged? How do you put it onto the airplane? Uh, where do you stop en route to get to that destination? What's at that destination? What do you have to deploy uh, prior to getting to that destination to be able to handle it? And, uh, and if you're going to do air refueling on top of that, where are the tankers going to come from? How do you coordinate that airspace? How do you coordinate the times at which they're going to be met? As we do our airlift operations all over the world today, whether it be in the former Soviet Union, whether it be in Somalia, whether we do things in Bosnia, all of those things have to be taken into account, and it's a synergistic effect on how they all fit together to make it happen in a perfect, uh, in a perfect world. With the ending of the Cold War, we all fully realized that our military forces uh, need to become smaller. Where the smallness uh, ends or the largeness uh, ends, uh, is dependent on our, on our policy makers. Strategic lift, uh, mobility becomes even more important to us as we become more of a home-based force and reduce our presence overseas. Flexibility is the key to success of, of air power. Having a core airlifter that provides the full spectrum of what we have to do to meet our policy objectives. Let me talk just a little bit about how the military airlift system works now, and that is that it takes a minimum of three airplanes to do the military airlift mission with. We, we have a C-130 airplane that does uh, short field or in theater work, short haul work. Uh, we have the C-141 and the C-5 that do strategic or long haul work. The way the system has to work right now, of necessity, because you have all of these different types of airplanes that you have to deal with, is that the C-141 and the C-5 take our forces, our fighting forces, from the United States to some main operating base in an overseas area, wherever the objective area is, and it has to have a large main operating base to operate from. The cargo and troops have to be offloaded there, transshipped to another airplane, the C-130, or to ground mode, and delivered then to the front line where the fighting commander needs his troops and his equipment. Now, that's the beauty of the C-17 airlifter. It wraps all of that capability up into one airplane. And so now you can, you can uh, unload your troops and your equipment in the United States, and you can deliver them directly to the fighting commander where he needs them in the field, bypassing the transshipment point. It's much more efficient, it's much quicker, it gets the troops there better, and it lessens the problems for the airlift manager because now, uh, he or she can do everything with one airplane that they used to have to do with three or more aircraft. Uh, we're called uh, C-17 deployment. ...and administrative people to operate a formal school using very high-fidelity training devices, state-of-the-art, because as you know, the C-17 is a very much state-of-the-art, data-intensive airplane. The aircrew training systems learning center 
has computer-based training as the primary way to impart all the knowledge of this airplane. It is a self-paced PC-based system that's run by a training management system and an authoring system all in the background. A student will go there and start taking lessons on these difficult subjects, proceed at his own pace and take tests at the end, uh, remediated if he doesn't get the material, all preparing him for his time in the air vehicle simulator. It has a 226 degree visual system. It has six degrees of motion. It's very much like flying in the airplane. The emphasis for the C-17 air crew is on mission qualification, not just proficiency in the airplane. And so we're able to do all of those mission elements, such as aerial refueling, ski station keeping equipment, and do an airdrop or come to a base for landing. And then when they go across the street, so to speak, into the airplane environment, our graduates are now the, some of them are now the examiners and instructors, and they take them on their flight portion. The pilot reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. Well, I like the C-17. It's uh, very automated, and it allows the pilot a lot of information, as you can see on the displays, to aid him in flying. Another thing is that the C-17 is a fairly easy plane to fly. We have flight computers that can aid us in keeping the plane smooth and stable. We can put in the plane into a 30-degree bank, and a lot of times you can let the stick go and the plane will stay there. This is the first plane that I've ever experienced flying with a HUD. And what it does is it assists in him bringing his head up to look for other traffic and to see what's going on outside. He doesn't always have to look inside to see what the plane is doing, and that aids a lot. Please guide all the passengers. Please take their seat belts. The loadmasters have their own simulator for the very first time so that they don't have to use an airplane for training. They can go with the pilots in a crew environment in a learning uh, situation loadmaster simulator. They have a cargo load model that is one-tenth scale where they practice uh, weight and balance and uh, everything up to tying down the equipment with models that are exactly what the Marine Corps and the Army wanted us to carry in the C-17. The Loadmaster is the most supremely happy crew member in the C-17. As a Loadmaster, we never did simulators. So it was a new experience the first time, and it was nice because it gave us a chance to get used to the systems before we actually come out to the plane. This is probably the best thing that was ever done for a Loadmaster. From this point, we can control just about everything that has to do with our part of the aircraft from our seat. The airplane that I used to fly, the 141, is a very basic, bare-bones type of airplane. The Loadmaster did not have hardly any control over the airplane. Right now, I like the fact that I have more input than I ever had before, and I'm not just sitting back here along for the ride. I am part of the decision-making process, and I like that. We really do need this airplane. As I said earlier, I was on a 141, and it's a very old and very tired airplane. I worry about my husband, who's also a flight engineer on 141s. I worry about him flying on that because it is so old, and it's 50s technology. It's taken too long for many different reasons to bring this airplane online, and our nation is in dire need of additional airlift capability. Our aircraft are getting old. The crises around the world haven't changed. As we bring forces back from overseas, the need for airlift becomes even more important to our nation to meet our national policy objectives. If I had the opportunity to walk through uh, to the factory and talk to the, talk to the management at Douglas from an operational perspective, from the people at Team Charleston, the first thing that I would say is, thank you for the good product that you've given us. We're excited about the product. Continue to look for ways of improvements. In our world of quality and continuous improvement, we must do that. You need to give us a product that doesn't have a lot of paper with it. You need to give us a product that, uh, that uh, reduces the retrofits over time that takes away from the training that we do here at Charleston. We like our product. It's a good airplane. Knowing the hard work and dedication uh, that's out at Long Beach and in all of the subcontractors throughout the field, we know that, that when the airplane finishes all of its testing and as we move into the next century, we're going to have a great core airlifter for our, for our nation.